so if you came here uh, at the end of the last ice age, it's, uh, it's conceivable that you might look at these uh, valleys and uh, uh, have an idea uh, that you might recognize it. I think there's a tendency uh, probably because of uh, uh, Hollywood and, and just a common misperception that these uh, first people to enter New Mexico were dull or dull-witted or uh, filthy cavemen, that kind of stuff. <laughs> the opposite couldn't be more true. Um, I think that uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by 20,000 years ago, um, uh, humans were uh, a at the apex of their ability to uh, live uh, off the land, uh, to take down big game uh, of any size uh, at their will, and to live uh, the way they, they chose to. Uh, those people were able to live off the land, could uh, move quickly, uh, didn't uh, take up residences in specific places, but they might stay for a few days or weeks and then move on. And so because of that lifestyle, they were able to move quickly to all points of North and South America. They certainly uh, visited the Ojito. because uh, the archaeology shows uh, Paleo-Indians in the area. Uh, the first guys to uh, come into um, uh, the Ojito here probably uh, would have looked at the geology uh, in a way that it's pretty pretty much is today. Those cliffs would be there, um, the valley would be here, probably the water would be running here. Um, one of the most uh, famous uh, Paleo-Indian um, occupations in the United States, of course, is five miles from here in uh, Sandia Man Cave. Uh, uh, and so since there's only uh, really a half a dozen uh, uh, riparian habitats uh, in the Sandias, uh, you can bet uh, that uh, uh, this was a uh, favorite place to visit and hunt. An interesting thing happened at the end of the Ice Age. We went, uh, our climate changed from uh, uh, one of the wettest uh, to one of the driest uh, in an extremely short amount of time. By uh, 8000 BC, the southwest was, uh, uh, was gripped in a, uh, in, a, in a drought probably uh, at least as bad as we are today, um, uh, made the, um, all the megafauna uh, go extinct and they had to change their lifestyles. They had to move up into higher locations and that's what you see happen with the people that had uh, been hunting in the plains of Clovis and uh, eastern New Mexico and hunting uh, giant sloths and that kind of thing uh, at will to uh, heaven to uh, eke out a, a tougher living. And uh, one of the uh, things that they had to do besides move into um, smaller animals uh, like deer, they also uh, started uh, collecting seeds like pinon nuts. Uh, uh, pinon nuts uh, being a, a pretty important part of a, of a diet in a drought. Uh, rather than uh, being a loose family unit that could uh, travel at will and never spend uh, uh, the same year in the same place. It uh, caused them to aggregate as a society. They uh, had to start uh, uh, working with uh, bigger uh, groups, other family groups. This is the beginning of uh, the beginnings of agriculture by um, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, populations grew, tasks uh, became stratified, societies became more complex. What uh, that ended up doing for um, places like this uh, valley here is they moved to more uh, a sedentary lifestyle and the uh, ability to not have to depend on uh, game which depended so much on the weather and were able to start small-scale irrigation and have crops at the end of the season which they could store and, and be able to stay in the same place and spend the winter here. Uh, by 
900 AD uh, uh, Pueblo uh, phenomenon of, uh, of the East Mountain area uh, was uh, starting and uh, the adjacent Pueblos within just five miles of here, Tejeras Pueblo, Paco Pueblo, Tonque Pueblo, and then the Galisteo Pueblos out to the east uh, flourished. It looks like they were w within the sphere of influence of the Chaco trading phenomenon because of our uh, the capricious weather patterns in New Mexico. Uh, uh, if you had a year when your crop failed, uh, you could still get fed and uh, uh, your kids wouldn't go hungry um, and uh, uh, food would come from another area uh, of the state and uh, there was some kind of a system in place where uh, you made up for that. Of course, that uh, fell apart uh, in the droughts of uh, the uh, 11th century and uh, kind of went into one of the worst times uh, for the people of uh, New Mexico. They didn't want to uh, 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 live with that kind of a, uh, a giant uh, system of elites and uh, a dependence on trading and taxation, basically. and. Uh, uh, it led to a new kind of uh, Pueblo society, and that was uh, independent, self-sustaining, uh, individual Pueblos uh, that had uh, land from, say, the top of the Sandias and a strip all the way down to the uh, lower areas so that they were able to sustain their own wood uh, mm -hmm. uh, foraging, uh, deer populations, uh, agriculture, and wintering areas. And there were, there were hundreds of Pueblos uh, in the areas uh, between here and uh, Santa Fe uh, over to the Galisteo Basin and down into the Rio Grande Valley when the when the Spanish arrived. LA-24, um, the, it's a several hundred room Pueblo uh, just over on this little uh, uh, bench over here outside of uh, where this water runs down through here. Use the water here uh, for irrigating fields. But it, it's remarkable to look at a Pueblo that's living simultaneously beside a place so close as Tejeras and to have them have completely different pottery uh, styles. Uh, they were they were independent. They were living uh, very differently in a lot of places. Uh, they uh, uh, didn't even speak the same languages and they could be living side by side. In fact, right here in this uh, valley here, uh, these Pueblos to the north were speaking a different language uh, than these Pueblos right here. So very interesting time. The Spanish saw the uh, surpluses that the Pueblos uh, were able to carry. Uh, some places a three-year supply of, of food stored and uh, assumed that they were able to uh, continue to support this. And so the uh, taxation uh, in the 17th century, along with a lot of other things like uh, European diseases, uh, led to the end of those surpluses and uh, really led to the Pueblo Revolt. As the Spanish Empire failed over the course of the next hundred years, um, New Mexico became more and more isolated from where the crown really still held its power, which was down in Mexico City. Tejeres Canyon has always been a major artery that connects the Great Plains to the Rio Grande. In 1763, the Spanish founded Carnuel, an outpost in the Sandia Mountains. The village was built as a buffer against raiding Apaches. The settlement failed. But they managed to resettle further east in 1819. The Spanish called their new village San Antonio de Padua. Uh, that uh, led to uh, more interdependence between the Spanish lifestyle and the Indian lifestyle. And then the uh, uh, Spanish uh, came to understand that uh, 
the way to survive in such a harsh environment is to was to adopt the agriculture and the uh, lifestyles uh, in a lot of ways of, uh, of the Pueblos. So uh, what we're really seeing today um, in New Mexico is what happened after 400 years of, of uh, these uh, two uh, very different uh, um, uh, social structures uh, uh, becoming uh, maybe not one but uh, more, uh, more interrelated and interdependent. Mm -hmm.